Thank you, Ivan. Yeah. You know, you were charged with creating this uh, site-specific installation. Rex Whistler's uh, original contribution has obviously stoked a lot of emotion over the years for various different reasons. I watched your piece and um, thank you for the breakdown. Really appreciate that. Definitely. You must have gone through a load of information in order to bring that to life. I wondered when you knew, because you knew that you were charged with this, did it look like what it's finally ended up like? And what was the process of creation like? It's interesting because, um, you know, obviously there is a lot of controversy around this state. I think. Um, I, obviously we are coming from the time of kind of, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter and all that kind of thing and the kind of specific moves to bring down problematic artworks. You know, so it's the bringing down of, problem, of um, problematic statues and everything. And, um, and yes, and, and so there has been that kind of conversation around this space. And originally it was kind of calls for the whole thing to kind of come down. Um, however, I'm a person who very much believes that this stuff is evidence. It's evidence for the prosecution. Yeah? And so, in a sense, especially in a museum, we have to look at this stuff and use it to kind of, to kind of uh, um, examine history, to kind of give ourselves a sense of, of how people were thinking, you know, in this case, in the mid 1920s, um, and to kind of scrutinize and, and criticize that. Obviously, this work is controversial because there is some, some highly problematic content in there, racially, racially problematic. Um, and in a sense, I think um, this particular work has actually exposed more of it than was actually like in the public domain. Because in a sense, the most extreme part of the thing, you know, um, I mean, most people would not notice it because it's the small figure up in the tree. And when you just look at the thing, you, you know, it doesn't even look human. It doesn't even look like human being. But it's only when you then read um, the kind of story which him and his friend wrote about it, that you realise that this thing is supposed to be like this youth's mother. You know, and that's like the most extreme kind of thing you could ever come with. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, you know, um, if it had been another youth, like if they'd said, you know, there were two young men playing in the thing and one got caught and one, and one climbed the tree, that's sort of, you know, but young men climb trees, mm -hmm. yeah? It could be two white guys, it could be anything. But to say a woman, grown up woman, just can scamper up a tree, they're saying something serious within that. And even in the, in the context of kind of 1927, that was extreme racism. Because if you just look at the kind of politics around in 1927, you know, these people were encountering black people in different ways, there were black people working, there were black jazz musicians, all that kind of thing. And so even then, you know, to kind of speak about a black person in a tree hmm. is an extreme, you know, the same way as it is an extreme now. Yeah. I thought you did well to put context on Rex Whistler, or should I say Reginald? Um, <laughs> because Mr. Whistler. <laughs> Mr. Whistler. <laughs> Mr. Whistler. Mr. Whistler. Um, I thought you did well to put some the, the, the much needed context on mm -hmm. it. Uh, the reason yeah. I say that is because obviously we're not to know that he's an entitled uh, young man from Elton who's going to benefit from nepotism on any level mm. um, and to the degree which allows him to place that artwork in such a significant place in such a significant institution mm. just by virtue of who he knows right we're not to know that a hundred years later when we're consuming the art mm. so I thought you did very well to, to kind of uh, put context on that how long did that take you there's a lot of detail there that makes a lot of sense and kind of helps to anchor one's perspective on, you know, who the family were, what they were about, that just taking in the art itself doesn't give. So how long did those, did that element take you? Well, there's a kind of research thing which happened, but I think, I always think that that is important with my work. You have the subject and then you, you, you kind of research around it. You find the readings, you, you, find, you find what's out there. And, and there were some kind of key books and whatever about him but not that many. And so there are a whole range of things which are missing. 
Like there's nothing out there which I could find which actually talks about his images of black people. And there are lots of them. You know, so that's that's a gap. That is a book which somebody has to go out and write. Mm. And that's why um, in the piece we have a line that somebody should actually write a book about it and mm. call it Whistler's Blacks. Because it's not out there. Um, but stuff around his relationship um, with that woman, he, 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 with Olivia, there is a there is a kind of um, there is a book about that um, um, called A Curious Friendship because it was a very strange thing. I mean, he was twenty, yeah. he was nineteen years old when he met her, She's and 50. she was fifty. Yeah. It was fifty. She was more than fifty. Right. So they had this kind of strange relationship, but they were the best of friends, closest of friends, and everything. Um, and there was a, there was a PhD thesis by a woman called Nikki Fratter who had written a lot about it. And then from that, we just picked up on clues and, you know, explore this, explore that. Um, you know, so it's that kind of, but, but um, I always like to do um, research-based work. Um, I always like the work to be you know, both a learning process for me, because I'm curious about that kind of thing, but also um, if you can actually bring that learning process through to the audience, so when somebody comes and sees the work, they leave the work knowing more, you know, than they arrive with. And I think that's I think that's quite important. Even if the motive for art existing being created is ultimately to enlighten and entertain, um, and or just sheer indulgence, mm. does that mean that we got right to run carte blanche and do institutions like this? have as custodians of said art a responsibility to question what's exhibited. I mean, yes, yes, the organisation does. However, I wanted to approach this thing um, from the point of view of, of the Tate as, as a museum. Yeah, it's an art gallery, but it's really a museum of art. And so, you know, and so what does, does a museum do? A museum holds historical objects. It looks after them. We hope for well, the British Museum, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I we, we digress. You can't call this thing there. But, you know, they're custodians. Yeah. However, in terms of kind of what we as an audience want from the museum, we want to be able to go into the museum and see an object. And, and actually learn about that object, you know, um, learn about its history, the context of its making, if it's problematic as this one is, you know, why is it problematic? What are those elements? What does it tell us about that time? And what does it tell us about now? And so um, all those things are really important. Um, and so I really wanted to approach this as a new, you know, as part of that conversation around what museums are for. So yes, it is an artwork in a sense because it, you know, it's made and it's you know, shot and all that kind of stuff. However, I was more interested in it as an intervention into a museum mm. to ask questions about, about what the museum is for and if, we have to, and if we have to keep these problematic works, you know, and I think we should, you know, how does that then, how can we then use the fact that they're here to expand the conversation around them to really you know, excavate and dig into them? Um, so yeah, I want to know about you, man, because you spoke. Um, no, keep you, you. I mean, you're lauded, lauded, right? Oh, Lord. You are. Anyway, go. You're lauded as you know, being renowned uh, for your artistic responses to specific historical relationships and geographical sites, right? Would that That's be fair? No, I don't think lauded for that. That's oh, my well, job. Well, I'm, I'm, gi I'm giving <laughs> That's it to a you. Job. Isn't That's it? a job description. I'm that. giving it to you, and no, no, no one's no, taking Lordy. it. That's job description. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I respond to things. Yeah, that's a description. Oh, well, where does where does this work yeah. rank in terms of the things that you've done? Well, you see, this is. I mean, and I really need to say this work is very different. It's different in scale. It's different in a whole range of ways, and it's different because more than anything else which I've done, this was a collaboration. This work would not exist as it does without the collaboration of some fantastic people. I saw, all the, I saw all the names at the end yeah. and I thought to yeah. myself, you know what, yeah. I must yeah. ask about that, so I'm glad yeah. you called that up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, usually I kind of work on the kind of one, you know, the sort of, the sort of one person thing, you know, very hands-on and stuff. However, this time, um, 
um, I decided first to kind of speak to a fantastic young producer called him Lauren G. Yeah, I said, you know, I'm working on this thing, you know, can you help me? And she just went off and she brought in her people. Right. And that was just amazing because that was just like on another level. Mm. Um, she brought in um, a, a, a cinematographer called Morgan K. Spence. You know, these people are artists and all of his team. And I was just like sitting you know, thinking, what well, this is, this is industry. You know, because it was that kind of, uh, I think it was that level. And so the whole thing was a fantastic learning curve mm. in that way. And then I was working with um, a, fan a fantastic script writer and dramatist called, called Jacqueline Malcolm on that side. Um, and she's done plays, she's done plays in the community, plays in all, you know, whole um, range of settings and kind of works with actors a lot. And so it was the actors that um, she works with. I mean, she works with um, um, uh, this particular actor, Ian Pink. Right. So when I look at Ian Pink, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> this guy is like the dead spit of Rex Whistler. Oh, is he? Yeah, he oh. looks just, if you look at the pictures, right. even when you see um, the kind of photographs, when you flash up the photographs and the paintings of, of kind of Rex Whistler, there's that image of, of him in the in his uniform. Right. Look at that. Oh. You, what do you even say it's the same guy? This actor just looks like him. I thought the two of them were great, actually. Yeah, and yeah, and then um, the woman who plays Edith is another one. You know, and she, um, uh, I could physically get her to to look like Edith and everything. And the professor, the professor is the person who comes in and asks the kind of questions that we would ask. You know, she uses that kind of you know, puts him to draw out draw out themes and also to confront him around you know the problematic nature of things. And so, um, in a sense, it was completely, it was a new experience for me because it was such a kind of grand collaboration. You know, bringing in all of these highly, highly specialised, like, professional artists. And it was great. Sounds like you learned a lot from both the process in terms of creating and researching. And uh, So, well, let me ask you, what would you want those who take this in to learn? What, if there's anything like to kind of be at the forefront of their thinking once they've consumed it, mm. what would that be? That's it, it comes back to the museum, to the role of the museum. It's a learning process. And so I just want people who kind of go in to, to kind of come out with a more enhanced sense of, you know, the work, its history, the artist, the moment it was made, you know, other things which were happening at that time, why it's problematic. You know, it's a learning thing. And so in a sense, to, to kind of come back to the idea of the museum, you know, if I walk in, into the science museum and I see an engine of that thing or whatever, I want to come away from that knowing more about, you know, that steam engine than when I went in. And that's just it. That's just like, it's just that kind of educational, you know, educational process that I'm interested in. And that, and that um, for me, is the thing that actually justifies us keeping these problematic works. If not, yeah, take it down. But we need to keep it because it, of what it teaches us about that history. Do you think your yeah. work will be as evocative in 100 years? Well, who knows about 100 years to take? You might come down after three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? Like, you you can't even, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting that that work managed to stay there for 100 years. I think that's an interesting thing because mm. it was only made. I mean, if you look at all the initial stuff around it, it was decoration for a cafe. They didn't even call it art; they called it a decoration. But apparently, the term decoration is the term that they used for a mural back in the day, which is just like you know. But the fact that it has been around for a hundred years makes it into a museum artifact. I think. Keith Piper, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for your time, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs>